Welcome back to the special storm edition of Patients 2017. In this video, we'll address disorders of the fasciculata with a focus on hypocortisolism. And just as a reminder, I've left Massachusetts and am coming to you live from poolside in sunny Florida, where the weather is always warmer and the blueberry pancakes are always more scrumptious. In this section, we will resume our discussion of adrenal disorders and no focus on cortisol failure. It is prudent to begin this discussion by considering the causes of cortisol failure. These causes can be organized as acute or insidious. The patient with acute cortisol failure is almost always in shock, at least on step one. This makes sense with pituitary hemorrhage, referred to as apoplexy, as well as acute hemorrhage into the adrenal gland. The circumstances leading to adrenal hemorrhage are independently associated with shock, such as sepsis from Neisseria meningitides. So sepsis and acute adrenal failure would be expected to cause shock of the vasodilatory variety. The last instance of HPA failure is more subtle. On step one, vignettes have a patient using chronic steroids, such as a patient with an autoimmune disorder. There is sudden cessation of steroids in a high-risk circumstance, such as emergency surgery. There is a catastrophic outcome that permits them to ask a derivative question about cortisol physiology. We'll review this entity herein, but I did want to alert you to their treachery, and for that reason, I include the entity with the acute disorders. Insofar as the more indolent causes of cortisol failure, there are central causes involving the hypothalamus or pituitary. More commonly, however, primary adrenal gland failure accounts for the lion's share of hypocortisolism. I do include exogenous steroid cessation again to highlight that prednisone cessation is associated with hypocortisolism and suppression of the HPA axis in particular. They want you to be familiar with this point. As far as the central causes are concerned, Hypothalamic failure from such entities as craniopharyngioma, tuberculous infection, or granulomatous disease are fairly uncommon. You are much more likely to hear about pituitary failure in the form of ischemic pituitary injury from Sheehan syndrome or pituitary failure from a mass. The most common masses will produce prolactin or growth hormone or produce nothing as in null cell tumors. Truth is, these are still in the minority when it comes to cortisol failure, and conditions such as prolactinoma and growth hormone adenoma will be tested independently of the HPA access. The majority of vignettes will focus on primary adrenal gland failure. Of these, autoimmune glandular destruction will be the most common. We've already seen in other sections several examples of adrenal failure from infiltrated disorders. I refer to these as the bait and switch. You're chugging along, reading a vignette that smells like a straightforward lung cancer question. Then they pull the switch, and you are dealing with adrenal insufficiency. We negotiated these muddy waters during our discussion of hyponatremia. So these are the major players. Be familiar with these diseases and their association with hypocortisolism. Moving along, let's look at the manifestations of hypocortisolism. I will focus on those that should command your attention. Almost all patients with low cortisol will be described with weight loss and fatigue. The blood pressure will be listed as subnormal. On the extreme, they might be observed with low glucose. The big ticket item will be the presence of hyperpigmentation, but only if from adrenal failure. Remember, you need a high CRH or ACTH level for the excess pigmentation. Whereas the pigmentation is generally seen in sun-exposed regions, the NBME seems more interested in patchy pigmentation in places such as the lips and buccal mucosa. Whereas in ACTH-dependent hypercortisolism, pigmentation is associated with the ACTH homology with MSH, in primary adrenal failure, the mechanism is the traditional description. CRH stimulates POMC, which in turn is cleaved into ACTH and melanocyte-stimulating hormone, MSH. Just to underscore the mechanism and feedback loop in adrenal failure, the hypothalamus does respond with increased CRH. So the major clinical manifestations of adrenal failure come not from cortisol failure, but from aldosterone failure. No aldosterone means no hydrogen ATPase pump, 
So a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis is seen. No aldosterone means no sodium reabsorption. Salt cravings will be reported. But more importantly, the patient will present with hyponatremia. The low sodium is from ADH secretion trying to correct the decreased effective circulating volume associated with hypotension. Recall from our discussions of hyponatremia, this would be referred to as non-osmotic ADH release, and the urine osms would be appropriately concentrated. And finally, hyperkalemia will also be seen. Aldosterone secretion is normally increased in response to high potassium independent of the renin-angiotensin system. Thus, low sodium, high potassium, and non anion gap acidosis is the characteristic pattern for primary adrenal failure. Just as a reminder, in the adrenogenital symptoms, we see the same exact pattern. Specifically with 21-hydroxylase deficiency, there is neither cortisol or aldosterone produced. The neonate will present with the same signs and symptoms of adrenal failure just discussed. Remember, the 17-hydroxy pathway is intact with excess production of androgens, so the child will be characterized by ambiguous genitalia, if female, and precocious puberty is noted in the male. But this is the subject of another lecture. If secondary or tertiary failure accounts for hypocortisolism, the RAA system is intact, so you would not expect to see this electrolyte pattern. This is more a reminder of the dissociation in the glomerulosa layer uh, from ACTH secretion, another point I've beaten to death. In addition to the manifestations just reviewed, you can expect symptoms of the underlying causes. Most notably, mass effect will be observed if from pituitary failure. Sepsis with flank pain in the setting of adrenal hemorrhage will be reported. Failure of other hormones would suggest central causes. Cancer, HIV, or TB are associated with the infiltrative disorders. And finally, the presence of autoimmune disease is relevant for two reasons. Number one, the patient may have stopped steroid therapy. And number two, adrenalitis is associated with other autoimmune diseases, as we'll see. Insofar as the response to hypocortisolism, this should now be intuitive. Based upon the etiologies, you should be able to sort out the responses to low cortisol. So an acute hemorrhage of either the adrenal or pituitary, there won't be questions asking about physiologic response as these folks are toast. With hypothalamic failure from infiltrative disease or suppression from exogenous steroids, the CRH and ACTH will be diminished. In pituitary failure, CRH is elevated with low ACTH and cortisol. And in primary adrenal failure, both the hypothalamus and pituitary respond appropriately with elevated levels of CRH and ACTH respectively. So let's make the diagnosis. Clinical suspicion is based on symptoms, physical exam, underlying risk factors such as malignancy, and laboratory abnormalities. Once the diagnosis is suspected, a cortisol level can be obtained, preferably in the morning. However, this is not the gold standard. On step one, if they give you a low cortisol value, put it in the bank. They're telling you the patient has hypocortisolism. But in clinical reality, the gold standard is the ACTH stimulation test. It is pretty straightforward. You obtain a cortisol level at time zero, followed by an ACTH bolus. The cortisol level should subsequently double. Once the diagnosis of hypocortisolism is established, you still need to sort out the cause. An ACTH level can be obtained to determine primary adrenal failure versus central disorder. And finally, some loose ends before getting to some questions. As previously mentioned, they do like the case of exogenous steroid use. The classic question is cessation of medication for any reason. What are the physiologic responses of CRH, ACTH, and cortisol? They are suppressed. What does the adrenal gland look like? Atrophy of the inner two layers, glomerulosa, was unaffected. In autoimmune adrenalitis, be aware of the association with other autoimmune diseases. These are never deal breakers, but they can certainly cluster the conditions for you to sort them out. Be familiar with glandular histology. We've made a major point of aldosterone being disconnected from ACTH, but in autoimmune glandular destruction, be aware that all three layers of the gland are impacted. So let's grab a few questions on the adrenal disorders. They love this diagram. 
you should be at least vaguely acquainted with the histology of the normal adrenal gland. I've labeled the diagram, including the medulla. We can't forget the medulla because it is unique from our adrenal discussion so far. So what cells are found in the medulla? These are described as postganglionic sympathetic neurons. They are innervated by cholinergic preganglionic sympathetic neurons. So what stimulates hormonal release? The answer is acetylcholine. I open with this question just to review what we've already discussed about the appropriate stimuli for each layer. Note again, aldosterone release is independently stimulated by hyperkalemia. The next question is that classic description. Patient has lupus treated with a quote-unquote medication. They don't call it prednisone, but go on to describe every sign and symptom of Cushing's. A beautiful description at that. Then the patient experiences sudden death. What's up with the adrenal gland? They continue to push the point that aldosterone secretion and the glomerulosa are ACTH independent. That is, steroids suppressed the inner two cortical layers, the outer layer remains functionally normal under the influence of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is a big ticket item for them over at the NBME. In fact, this is what they talk about when they aren't discussing lymphoma translocations. So here's the same patient. What's the hormonal response? Pause the recording and make sure you're comfortable with this point. Exogenous steroid use suppresses the entire HPA. CRH, ACTH, and cortisol are all suppressed. Eventually, CRH will recover, but in the instance of this vignette, the patient died suddenly. Next question. In this question, they're giving us high steroid values. High cortisol, ACTH reported. Do you remember the rule of thumb? Functional assessment prior to imaging. So let's first make the diagnosis of hypercortisolism. This is an ACTH dependent vignette because they're telling us the ACTH is elevated. So what's our next step in determining whether there is suppression? The answer is the high dose dexamethasone suppression test. We're gonna distinguish between ectopic production and pituitary adenoma. And what about the lung mass? The underlying cause may turn out to be ectopic production from a small cell tumor. However, this doesn't exclude the possibility of concurrent Cushing's disease. Similarly, in clinical reality, the lung mass on chest radiograph may be an incidental unrelated to the clinical presentation. So the correct answer is high-dose dexamethasone suppression to distinguish between pituitary adenoma versus ectopic production of ACTH. And finally, same approach as previously discussed. Data trumps verbiage. We have the combination of hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis characterized by the low bicarb. And these are all in keeping with primary adrenal failure. They also included a low cortisol. They're asking you to make the diagnosis. So what is the confirmatory test for adrenal failure? They aren't asking the cause. So a bolus of ACTH would be given. In primary adrenal failure, there will be no bump in the cortisol value. In terms of etiologies, in large adrenal glands in the setting of a chest mass would suggest metastatic lung cancer is the cause. And this is an example of an infiltrated disorder causing adrenal failure rather than Addison's disease. And that concludes our discussion of cortisol disorders. I hope you've enjoyed this winter edition of Adrenal Disorders. Stay warm.